Hello world, I'm Nick Proud and today we're going to talk about using Postman to test APIs. Before we start, make sure you like and subscribe to the channel and if you're interested in more information around .NET, software development, RPA and all those good things, then head over to my website at automationmission.com. You can also find me on Instagram as code commit repeat. So let's get into Postman and testing APIs. So as software developers, we're probably gonna to have to use APIs at some point. But if you're not familiar with APIs, APIs are essentially interfaces into a other piece of software that allow you in through code. So it stands for Application Programming Interface, which means that you can use a request through code to speak to another system or another piece of software, get information from it, send data in, change data, all those things that you would be able to do inside the UI of a, of a piece of software, but in the back end instead. So one example may be that you're sending an invoice into Zero Accounting. They've got an API which allows you to build an invoice as JSON and then post that JSON into their API so that it appears in the system. Now, very often in C Sharp and other programming languages, we need to work with APIs. We need to figure out how they work. We need to figure out what kind of responses we're going to get, what kind of parameters are needed. And sometimes it's useful to just test those requests. Testing requests inside code is fine, but I think sometimes also having an application which helps you to organize all your tests and organize all your requests in one place can be really useful. And that's where Postman comes in. So you may or may not have come across an API client before, but essentially Postman is an API client, but it's more than just a client. It allows you to organize requests into workspaces and collections. So today what we're gonna do is build a very simple workspace and a collection of API requests to a an API called JSON Placeholder. You've probably seen me use this in some previous videos but JSON placeholder essentially acts as a test bed for dummy data it's a sort of test API that you can use to play around with HTTP requests and API calls so the first thing to do is head over to postman.com so that's the website that you can see on my screen and then you can sign up for free postman allows you to do API requests inside the browser or you could also download their desktop app sometimes I find that more useful but essentially you need to sign up first. You can use your Google account or some other single sign-on account, and then you've got the application and you're good to get set up. So this is the workspace that I've got set up. And from here, I can set up lots of different organized API calls uh, for testing, or even if I wanted to actually trigger some API calls manually. But essentially the workspace is where you organize all those things together. And there's lots of really cool features like being able to collaborate with teammates, for example. So one of the things I found really useful is if I'm working on a project with uh, other colleagues or the developers, and I need to update a particular API request, show them how I'm doing an API call, all those sorts of things around collaboration, I can invite them to my workspace and they can change or update the API requests or simply view them as needed. On the left-hand side of the screen, you can see there are various options in the form of collections, APIs, environments, all those sorts of things. And I'll probably just focus on collections and maybe the environments area for this video because that should be enough to get you started. So in the collections tab, you can see I've got lots of different collections listed. And the second one here is called the JSON placeholder API. So what I've done is basically created a collection for each API that I want to speak to. And then inside that collection, you create your requests. Now, as you probably know, API requests based on HTTP or RESTful APIs have get, post, patch, put, all these different HTTP methods. And so each request would be one of those method types. So you can see in this example on the left-hand side, I've created a collection called JSON placeholder API. But again, using that example, if you were speaking to the zero API, for example, you could create a collection called zero API and then put your requests inside it. To create a collection, you would simply click the plus button here. It will create a collection with just the staple new collection name. And then you can rename that if you like. So you can just click rename and you can say my cool collection. So I'm going to stay inside my JSON placeholder API collection because I think that's fine for what we need to do. And I'm going to build up some requests. So if you're not familiar with JSON placeholder already, I'll give you a brief introduction. So you can see here it's a free fake API for testing and prototyping. So this is what we're using in place of whichever API you would be using for your project. 
See here, it explains that you can use JSON placeholder as a free online REST API that you can use whenever you need some fake data. So it's actually probably very useful if you just want to practice making API calls. If you're learning, say, C Sharp or Python or some other programming language, and you want to get to grips with making API calls, then this is perfect. You can just use this to get some dummy data and get that practice in. So this is laid out in the same way that any other public API would be laid out in terms of its documentation. You can see here that there are several different endpoints or resources that JSON Placeholder has. Uh, there's a posts endpoint, there's comments, albums, photos, these are all the objects that we can mess around with. For this video, I'm going to be doing API calls to the comments endpoint. You can see here that all different HTTP methods are supported. So you can use HTTP or HTTPS for this API. Most of the time you would hope you're using HTTPS, but that's another video. And you can see examples of how get or post or put URLs would be laid out. Looking at the guide, the guide for JSON Placeholder gives some examples of how you can make API requests, but this is where it can get a little bit complicated if you are not necessarily using a specific programming language and you just want to get your head around APIs in general. So for example, if we wanted to get a resource, we can get a post this way by using this endpoint. So I'm going to disregard this example and I'm going to make this get request in Postman. So I'm going to clear out my collection. I don't want this request anymore. I want to start from scratch. So in my JSON placeholder API collection, I'm going to create a new request. So over here on the right hand side, I can click the view more actions button and I can click add request. This will add a new request into the collection and by default, it will be the HTTP method get. Give the request a name. So we can say for this one, I want to rename it to get comments. And for this request to get those comments, as the documentation said, we're posting or actually getting from the URL uh, here, the jsonplaceholder.tipico.com forward slash comments. So according to the documentation, doing a get request on this URL would return the comments as JSON. So there's no authorization required, no headers required, nothing like that. It's just a simple get request to an endpoint. If we click send, you'll see that we get the result of the get request in this window here. So you can see we've got an array of objects and each of them represents a comment which has been pulled out of the API. But what if we don't want all the comments? Well, according to the documentation, we can also ask for a specific comment based on its ID. So if we take this one, for example, we just want to get the comment which is at two as the ID, then we can add a forward slash to this, put two, so this changes the URL of the request we're calling, click send again, and you can see we get just that specific comment. So this is obviously very specific to the JSON placeholder API, but the concept is pretty much the same. In most RESTful APIs, you'll have this concept of entities. So the entity in this respect is a comment. And if you ask for the comments endpoint, you'll get all the comments or all the entities that are specified. And then if you use a forward slash and then a particular ID, you'll get that specific entity if it exists. On the request, you can see the status that came back. So you can see the status 200 OK. It gives you the time in milliseconds that it took to actually make the call. So this is actually really useful in terms of benchmarking an API. So say you built your own API and you wanted to use Postman to get an idea of how long individual things took. You can see here that it's breaking down that time uh, across all the different activities that happened during that HTTP request. So you can see it took 0.09 milliseconds to do socket in initialization. There was an SSL handshake that took 7.65 milliseconds. So we're using HTTPS, which means that that SSL handshake needs to happen. And there was a download at the end of 2.71 milliseconds. So actually, if you're building an API, you could use this to see where your bottlenecks are. The size of the request is here as 1.3 kilobytes. And again, this is broken down even further to show you that 305 bytes of this re response was actually at the body, <clears throat> the rest being the headers. You can save the response if you want to. So you can save as an example in Postman. So if you were building documentation, for example, you may want to save this as an example for, f for future use, or you could save it to a file. Getting more complex on the response that comes back in Postman, you can see there's a headers tab. So if we click headers, 
What Postman will do is take the response, pass out the headers that come back from the server you're calling, and it will display them in a readable format. So you can see the API return quite a few headers. Uh, there were things like the content type, for example. So you can see this is the value for the content type that was sent back. The connection header has keep alive. So you know it's much easier to read the response, uh, and Postman does a really good job at parsing a lot of these values that otherwise would be in a not very readable format. Now, what if we wanted to post something to our API? Well, let's take a look at our documentation to figure out how we would actually do the posts for this specific API. And then we'll take a look at Postman and how we would actually build that API call inside the app. So in the guide that we were looking at, I'm just scrolling down to creating a resource and I can see an example here for sending a request in as a post uh, in JavaScript. So I can see that it's uh, sending a request to this endpoint. So it's saying I want to do a post to this URL and you need to send in the JSON body. So again, whichever API you're using will have documentation with it, which explains what kind of payload is needed, what kind of content type. So if you were using something like a SOAP API, it would be XML. For most, most cases these days with a REST API, it's JSON. For this specific example, we're sending in a, a JSON object which has a title with a value, a body with another value, both of them strings, and a user ID with an integer value. The content type needs to be JSON, not a shock, and the character set UTF-8. So we can use this to build that same request in Postman. So I'm going to copy that post endpoint. I'm going to go back over to Postman, create a new request. So add request. And this time I'm going to change the method to post. I'm then going to paste in the URL and it's time to build the payload. So if we look back at our example, you can see that we've got title, body and user ID. All the all the properties are strings except for user ID which is an integer. So let's build that in here. We need to write some JSON. So in Postman we can select the body tab to show us the request body that we're going to be sending up. And at the moment you can see it says that this request does not have a body. So we need to add one. But how do we add one? Well we've got lots of different options. We've got form data which is not the content type we're sending. We're sending JSON. If you were sending form data Again, Postman gives you this handy interface where you can add your key and values. If you were sending form URL encoded data, you could do the same thing. If you were sending binary, you could select a file. So some APIs allow you to send binary data to upload files. Postman facilitates that for you. And GraphQL as well, which I think is quite a new feature. What we're interested in is a raw payload. So we're going to select raw, and then we're going to type in the value of our payload ourselves. Sounds complicated, but it really isn't. We're just going to be typing JSON into this window. So first of all, I'm going to create our JSON object. It's got some nice, handy, automatic helper functions there, which actually you know, fill in the uh, brackets for you because it knows it's a JSON object. Then we're going to put in our properties. So we needed title. So we'll put that in there. And I'll put uh, some comment as a title, comma. Then we needed body. So we'll put the body of the comment, which is this video is so cool. And then we needed user ID. So we'll put that in. And user ID is a number, so I'm going to put 24. Great, so we've got our payload written out, but we still need to specify the content type. Now we could go into our headers here, click the hidden button, and it would show us the headers that are actually going to get sent as part of this request. And then we could change this to content type application slash JSON. We don't actually have to do that. What we can do in the body instead is say here, that we want the content type to be JSON, and that will handle it for us. You can see here, now that we've selected that, application slash JSON has now been populated in the content type header. On the subject of headers, most of the APIs that you speak to, in fact, I'd say 90% of the APIs you speak to, will need some kind of authorization to be carried out. Now, there are different types of authorization that can be used on uh, various APIs, which is probably not in the scope of this video, uh, but some of them include things like OAuth, basic authentication, OAuth 1, which is slightly different. But essentially, you would use the headers 
to carry out that authorization process. And most of the APIs that you use will have documentation on what is expected in the headers when you authorize. So I'll probably do a video at another point to talk about the specific authorization types, but just for this video, if you were using authorization and you needed to put things into the headers in Postman, this is where you'd do it. The other thing on that topic is that Postman has an authorization tab where you can actually choose the authorization type that's needed. So say you were using bearer tokens, for example, you could say I'm using bearer tokens as the auth type and it will give you the parameters that are actually needed. So you don't have to build loads of complicated headers. You can just say I'm using this authentication type. Here's the data you need. Same for things like OAuth. So if I was choosing OAuth2, Postman knows that because OAuth is a standard methodology for using authentication, it needs specific values. You choose that and it will say, give me your access tokens and all the other things that are needed for that kind of authentication. Again, for this API, there's no authentication required, but obviously for yours, just bear that in mind. So it looks like we've got everything we need. We've set the HTTP method to post and we've put in our URL. We've put our content in the raw section of body and we've set it to JSON. So let's send the request and see what we get back. So we'll click send, it'll send the request, and there we go. We've got a returned payload from the server, and as expected, we've been given back an ID. So the API on the server side has saved the comment, generated an ID for it, and sent it back to us along with the payload that we sent over. So if your projects are very dependent on APIs, or you find yourself developing APIs, or speaking to APIs a lot, or even if you just want to learn more about APIs and how REST requests work, Postman is a really good starting point. I hope you found this useful. Please let me know how you get on working with Postman. And if there are any other HTTP clients that you like using, I know there's quite a few out there, but Postman for me seems to be the best in terms of organizing your requests. Don't forget to like this video if you found it useful. And if you want more tips and tricks in software development, .NET or RPA, head over to automationmission.com, which is where I have my blog. And until next time, keep coding.